this uh, panel is about uh, social entrepreneurship in the education sector in Egypt. We've heard a lot about the importance of that sector. And uh, I, and I'm sure you, are very eager to hear their experiences. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, to my immediate left is Ali uh, Sayyid Ahmed uh, from the Learners Program of the Tahrir Academy. It focuses on maximizing students' educational experiences. Previously, she worked in Yahoo before uh, 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 helping set up this uh, initiative. To her left is uh, Ms. Yasmin Hilal. She's the founder and executive director of Educate Me, an NGO that helps underprivileged children complete their education. Uh, she's received several awards, including the King Abdullah II Award for Youth and Innovation and Achievement, the Mubadirun Masr Award, and the Negma Impact Egypt Award. Uh, to her left is uh, Ms. Amina Asai, a co-founder of Hilm, an NGO that uh, provides programs and employment services for individuals with disabilities in Egypt. Uh, Hilm also partners with the Intilaq Project, the first accessibility certification project in Egypt. Uh, and uh, we are joined, and I'm glad you could uh, join us uh, today, by Mr. Muhammad Abdel Qadir. Uh, Mr. Abdel Qadir is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International and Foreign Language Education at the U.S. Uh, Department of Education. Uh, Muhammad, thank you for being with us today and sharing your thoughts. Let's get straight into it, and I'll turn to, um, to Alia. So basically, as, uh, as you've uh, heard in the video, that Tahia Academy is all about focusing on the methodology of education. We decided to consciously laser sharp on one problem in education because we have a lot of problems. So we're focusing on the blended learning. We're focusing on tackling how people get educated. So it's basically the methodology. So we're basically thinking of how the students are learning and how the children focus on how to think, not what to think. So that's the major thing we're focusing on. So this person is Mahmoud, and this is my favorite kid. And this is not the same Mahmoud, but I'm trying to make it. So this Mahmoud is not, is not actually motivated to learn. He has no critical thinking skills, and he has no access to premium content. The same Mahmoud, but older 20-year-old one, is not employable, and he's not innovative, and he makes poor decisions. Because the skills that he was acquiring during his education wasn't really the needed skills for the marketplace now. And this is not the only problem of Mahmoud in Egypt. That's the major region problem that f basically reflects in the unemployment rates. A couple of years from now, the main criteria that will be requested in education is innovation, leadership, creativity, how to uh, think outside the box, which is not really what our education system providing at this point of time. So the main three problems that we discovered and we decided to focus on is the lack of motivation to learn. So students go to school and they're not motivated to learn. They don't understand the, what, they, what, the, what they're taking. They do not understand their classes. And they have no access to premium content. The Arabic content online is only 3%. And most of this is on like entertaining and social stuff, not education. And the third one is the uh, lack of critical thinking skills. So we decided to build our model, which is the blended learning, to provide motivation to learn so through providing a fun, gamified experience on the online platform, which is the first part of our blended learning, having an online experience that's fun, gamified, rewarding, gives incentive to the students, and access to premium content. So we take the, the government content, focusing on 13 to 18 Egyptian public schools, and convert this content into a premium one with the, much more related to your real life situation so you can understand why you're taking this content. And the third one is building a critical thinking skills. So the baseline for building the content is a critical thinking criteria that, inc that encourages students to understand, to think critically more than just uh, memorizing the content and put it into the exam and that's it, so they have to understand. So our solution, so why we decided to take online and offline, we can focus on online, which is ad tech, which is very motivating. But the point is in online, there's limitation of having like, we don't have interactivity, it's only passive education, so you can watch videos, you can watch infographs, you can go through PDFs. And the offline one is highly uh, logistically demanding, it's super expensive, the brick and mortar, the schools, the infrastructure is a bit challenging. So we decided to make, to, to actually take uh, the best of both worlds. So we decided to have a partial, the, so the student comes to Tahiya Academy, partially learn through online experience. He can log into the, our website, tahiyaacademy.org. He can find his content, and we have different educational tools. So he can watch a video, he can see an infograph, a PDF, have a discussion forum with other students, other teachers, and experience. 
change uh, ideas and opinions, and he takes the whole experience and take it offline to his own place. So housewife can be a teacher, can be an educator. A teacher can, can take the online experience and take it offline because you have to do experiments and projects and reflect the result uh, on the course online. And at the end of the day, you have a matrix on the website, you can check it, that actually measures your critical thinking skills. So we have an equation uh, mixed between likes, dislikes, uh, retention rate, your interactivity, the, the, the answers you've given for the questions, and then we give you a score of what, where do you stand in the critical thinking index. Uh, so that's basically the model. And we're actually focusing on two main stakeholders, educators and learners. So we do capacity building for the educators. We give them access to premium content. We've actually created a um, toolkit, which is a, a detailed manual on how can you log, on, uh, log in Tahrir Academy, take the content. How can you run a Tahrir Academy classroom? Because at the end of the day, if I'm taking all this learning experience and the teacher is taking it to the classroom in a way that is, uh, you have to do this and that and this and that, so at the end of the day, that's a passive education. I'm not going to do that. What I'm trying to do is how to make an inquisitive approach, how to ask, how to raise curiosity, how to engage the students. Because one of our values is the learner is the center of the education experience. He's the only one that can decide what he wants to learn, how he wants to learn it, and when he wants to learn it. And the presentation, I think, is done. That's the educators, and for the learners, we're trying to give them rewards. Um, which we're, we're always having competitions and sponsored by a corporate uh, sector, so they can give awards, they, they can engage the students in the learning experience. This is so far our impact. To date, I think we have, yeah, because I'm away from uh, my work for, uh, for like a couple of weeks now today, we've, uh, we had an, around 123, uh, 400K uh, registered learners across our different channels, and we have more than 12 million minutes watched. Uh, we've covered around 190 lessons through different educational tools. So that's basically our impact. Um, what's next is our focus now is on scalability, on how can we move with our model to the region so we can, uh, we can serve this in the Gulf area, in other countries, because the blended learning on its own can be applied on, on work, on, uh, on languages, on, on normal education, on, on, other, uh, on other countries' uh, education system. So what we're trying to do now on how, how to validate our model, we have a partnership with the American University in Cairo. They work side by side with us to validate that the blended learning is a way to learn that is, that is at the end of the day, serving what you want in terms of qualifications, skills, and um, that's so far our awards, and those are our learners. Thank you. Thank you, Alia. That's really uh, fascinating and very encouraging. Let's turn to Yasmin, please. Hi. Uh, I'm Yasmin Hillel, founder and executive director of, uh, of Educate Me, um, a nonprofit in Egypt. And I'm very happy to be here, so thank you very much for, for this, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know that in my introduction, it said that Educate Me focuses on helping underprivileged children continue their education. Uh, but, but as I'm going to tell you now, this is not actually what we do now. It's more or less what we started off doing. So I'm going to start off with our story. Um, so five years ago, on a very random day, uh, I was approached by a beggar on the street in Cairo who asked me for money because he wanted to send his three daughters to school. And it was very shocking to realize that he only needed $20. So back then, I said, you know what? Why not start a fundraising effort to find underprivileged children who want to go to school and just find the finances to help them do this? And the naive assumption here was that sending kids to school gets them an education. Unfortunately, however, this turned out to be far from the reality in Egypt. So through interacting with the first batch of kids we sent to school, we realized that when it comes to education, there are two big sets of challenges. The first one has to do with Egypt and the national system, which is under-resourced, poor teaching quality, um, real, uh, reliance on rote learning, and under-resourced learning environments. At the same time, we realized that there is 
also a global challenge when it comes to education, and this has to do with the whole um, skepticism towards the relevance of the industrialized education systems and the fact that they develop skills that are not necessarily relevant to the century we're in, and skills that do not necessarily help students cope with the 21st century challenges. So th through interacting with the children, getting to understand from them what education means to them and getting to see the potential that they have in their eyes, we came up with our vision or our ultimate vision uh, of what education should be about. So for Educate Me, the outcome of education is not just about literacy. It's not about helping people read and write, pass standardized tests, go to college and then go into the job market. We believe that the outcome of education is an individual who is self-actualized, meaning that an individual who knows who he is, what he wants to do, what he's capable of, and knows how to mobilize himself and his resources towards what he wants to achieve without stepping on other people's feet. So what Educate Me essentially tries to do is basically create a model that develops self-actualized children and make it accessible to every child in Egypt. Now, how do we do this? In order to do this, Educate Me works on four different pillars. We work on the uh, students or the children. So we develop full and part-time educational programs for uh, kids aged four to 15 through our grassroots community centers. We work on parents through developing their skills and parenting, uh, th through developing their literacy and parenting skills. We work on the educators or the teachers through providing developing their capacities through providing trainings. And finally, we try to work on the policy level through developing a proof of concept that can actually influence national education on the long term. Over the past five years, we've established a community development center in a low-income neighborhood called Talbeya in Giza, where we served more than 500 beneficiaries to date. Our children themselves have won an International Child Film Festival Award for one of their projects. And we have been actively participating in setting the national education strategy by the Ministry of Planning and Administrative Reform uh, nowadays in Egypt. So how does our model actually solve the challenges, national and global, when it comes to education? When it comes to the national challenges, one of the root causes that we believe hinders education is assessment and curriculum development. So how curricula are being developed and how learning is being assessed. So unfortunately, in Egypt, there are learning standards, they're uploaded on the website of the Ministry of Education, but what happens eventually is there is a textbook that is forced on each and every individual. And then when it comes to assessment, the learning is assessed in terms of how much knowledge you have memorized from the textbook. So again, what happens eventually is that the skill that is mostly being developed is memorization and not actually critical thinking, not really compare and contrast uh, uh, or any kind of relevant skills. So what we believe is a solution to that is to, to develop your curriculum based on standards. Unfortunately, these standards are actually there. They are there for the current uh, system in Egypt, but then they're not used. So we get these standards and we assess these standards. So we develop rubrics in order to assess the skills that has to do with literacy and otherwise. The second challenge that we think is there is pedagogy, which is basically how children or how students learn. When it comes to our system, this, the, the system is very teacher-centered. It's very top-down. So people at the top define everything for people below. And the teacher is the prime source of knowledge. While students have very little freedom to decide what they want to learn, how they want to learn it, and to even decide what success means for them. What we believe here is that the formula really needs to be flipped. So students need to be at the center of the learning process. They need to have freedom. They need to have a voice. And we've learned, we work very actively on that aspect in our culture. And finally, when it comes to the global challenges facing education, Again, most uh, education systems globally still focus primarily on literacy. It's very easy to develop, it's very easy uh, to measure and assess when it comes to achievement, but again, it's insufficient. So our model in Educate Me works on literacy, but also works on five other skills. We work on what Finland calls the four Cs, which are creativity, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, which have to do with how we think and how we interact with others. And finally, also on productivity, which has to do with our ability to transfer knowledge into um, real life relevance. Um, finally, where we are right now uh, and why we're actually here. So over the past few months, we've been approached by a lot of people who want to help us scale. Uh, and actually the last of them was an hour ago in this room. Uh, someone came to us and said, we have a place, we have children. We don't have a very established learning model and we want to see with you how we can do that. And we have so many ways in which we can scale. So we can go around establishing centers. Uh, we can franchise our models to other people. So we can actually expand through other people's resources. 
we can do trainings or learning consultancy and other people can go about it their way. And we're at a point where we're figuring out what's the best way to do this. We've also been approached by the government uh, because again, everybody knows uh, that education is a problem. Everybody knows that education is the solution, but nobody necessarily knows how to go about it. So we have been approached by the government as well to train the teachers in order to uh, at least work on the community education uh, segment in Egypt. And again, whether or not this is a good idea, whether or not this is going to actually um, reflect on impact is a question that we have in mind. And this is our biggest uh, benefit of working with RISE to think about research and evidence-based approaches from one side. How can we be able to document systematically the kind of impact that we have? How can we be able to uh, approach policy in a way that is good for us and also in a way that develops impact for the country? Uh, and finally, I'll leave you off with a very provocative thought. Um, we're here to talk about entrepreneurship. A lot of us here are entrepreneurs, but entrep entrepreneurship is not really something we've studied in school. We've had to learn it ourselves. We have to learn it on our own through trying and mostly through our failures. So I'll invite you to think about the world and how the world would look like if what we have been forced to learn on our own through life is what we actually learn collectively in schools. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin, that, uh, I mean, you communicated it very well, despite uh, the problem with our, uh, with our computer. I apologize for our computer failing. On the other hand, maybe we'll have a contribution to Metuelli's Recyclobikia <laughs> fund. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much uh, for that, Yasmin. Let's turn to Amina Sai. Okay, so this is actually a short video that shows you uh, a part of our lovely team. We have 350 volunteers back home, um, and we have uh, 11 full-timers. Um, and Helm is actually an inclusive environment, an inclusive um, NGO. And we're proud that uh, we are not waiting for change. We are trying to make uh, and be the change. I know, uh, cliche as it sounds, but it is true. Um, so let, you, let me introduce you to HELM and how it started. The difference between HELM and any other NGO that serves persons with disabilities in Egypt is that we decided to start not because we have someone in our families and not because we are personally affected by that at the time. It was basically because we wanted to make a statement that everybody deserves the right to live and to have the services and products um, according to their needs. So, for example, if you would go into an elevator and the buttons would be so high that you can't reach them, you can't use the elevator. It's the same thing with what we're trying to do with Helm. We're trying to say you need to make into consideration people who do not have the same abilities as you do. So what does Helm do? We're trying to promote employment. Why employment? Because every person with disabilities in Egypt, even though there are some efforts, but there is very little know-how about how to treat and how to develop persons with disabilities in Egypt. There is no research, there is no, um, there is no basis where when we started HELM to, uh, that we found to start our project based on. So basically there are 18 million persons with disabilities in Egypt. Uh, there are a lot of people who would say there are more. Some people wonder if that number is correct. I must say that we have uh, no um, accurate number in Egypt for uh, the exact number of persons with disabilities, but according to our research um, and dealing with other NGOs in the field, according to the World Health Organization, they're about 15%, and we have uh, um, statistics that prove otherwise that anybody who is um, interested can discuss after the presentation. Our main services are career development and job placement. Uh, we do training programs for persons with disabilities and organizations. And we also provide inclusion consulting services. And finally, we're going to be talking about Intolik. Helm has been able to serve a lot of corporates in Egypt. Let me tell you first what the real problem regarding persons with disabilities in Egypt. Starting from the day they're born, there is no proper diagnosis system in Egypt. There are only two places that are public that people can go and diagnose their child, and they're both based in Cairo. 
And also, we do not have proper statistics of the exact numbers. So when we went uh, to the um, research center in Egypt and we asked about how many uh, persons with disabilities in each disability, they do not even have a computerized system for that. So we do not have accurate statistics. And a lot of parents, when they have a child with a disability, they don't even know that their child has a disability, especially with um, uh, disabilities that, do not, uh, that are not physical and uh, developmental disabilities. So the real problem that we figured is that we do not really know what Egypt needs in order to solve that problem. So Dr. Mona Amir in AUC decided to help Helm by reinforcing the needs assessment research for every project that we do. So she said, yes, you know, there's a problem, but you really don't know what you should be doing um, and what are the roots of these problems. So we decided to dig deeper and then we figured out that the real problem is not really with the companies. We thought that the companies did not want to employ persons with disabilities. Well, that is part of the problem. But the bigger problem is that people with disabilities do not have any opportunity like any other person. It's already very difficult to live in Egypt and the education system is really bad. But at the same time, even persons with disabilities, they can't even reach the basic needs that they have for, for the proper education. Like they, don't, they don't even have access to bad education, if I may say. So what we tried to do is we started digging deeper about what are the exact needs for persons with disabilities in terms of like, okay, think of an example. If you would not, if you're locked at home and you're not able to communicate with anyone, if you can't get out of the house, it's not just about that, the, uh, the, the formal education, but also about communication, basic communication skills, how to interact with people, the fear that they have when people make fun of them or just even look at them as if they are a disability. Um, so these are some of our partners which we research on. We had uh, about 100 uh, different corporates um, and SMEs and different NGOs and we started studying what is the real problem that HR personnel face and why do they not hire persons with disabilities. And we discovered that the real problem is that they do not know how to handle them. They do not know where to put them and they are afraid because they are worried that when they put them on a front line or in a front desk, people will think, oh, we are not competent. And actually some of the companies actually admitted that this is a problem. So we started developing role models. We decided that it's not about how many people we employ, it's about the quality of the people that we employ. So for example, Mohammed Subhi was one of our first success stories. He works in L'Oreal. When L'Oreal first working with him, they said we wanted to employ them as a, um, in, for example, in the uh, cleaning department or as a teller, but that was it. So we started developing community days and we're going to show you what we do in these community days to try, to try and change their perceptions towards what persons with disabilities can do. And they started and Actually, Mohammed Subhi started working as a marketing coordinator. When he first came to Helm, his dream was to work with 600 LE. That was his dream. He said, I just want to work anywhere. He has polio. And then now he's working with 6,000 LE as a salary. We improved his English. We improved, uh, we started giving him access to proper trainings and, he, and it paid off. So basically, Mohammed is not only a role model for companies, he's also a role model for other persons with disabilities who said that this cannot happen. So we're telling them, here are the resources, you have to utilize them in order to become better. And also Mahmoud now works in Vodafone. There are many others, not so many though, like we were thinking we're going to have thousands of persons. And I have to be honest with you, we do not have thousands of people who are ready to work. They already have a very low self-esteem. They are not ready to go out of the house. And for example, Mahmoud lived in the eighth floor. How do we expect someone without an elevator in the eighth floor using a wheelchair to get out of the house? His brother and his best friend used to take him every day down the eight floors so that he can come to Helm and have his English trainings. Finally, now he changed his home and um, his parents kept saving so that they would move out of their house four years later after his accident. But that's not how it works for most people. Um, so these are also other role models like Shaime, she's visually impaired, and Ola Ammar. And this is an example of the Peugeot Community Day. We bring everyone who works in every corporate we deal with and we try to make a day and design it to make them see what a disability means. So we give them the experience of a visually impaired. We try to include persons with disabilities and mix them up into groups so that they would actually have that. So the types of training that we have are very different according to each the needs of each cor corporate and we customize it accordingly. And we also train persons with disabilities so we can bridge the gap from both sides. Finally is Intalik project. Intalik is a project um, where 
after a lot of research, we discovered that the real problem is accessibility. The basis of all the problems for persons with disability is that they cannot get access to services and goods. And this is what we decided to do. We started to build a program so that we would visit every single location in Cairo as a start, and we help them through a process for assessment, and we're basing it according to the ADA um, checklist. For, for existing buildings, and we're trying to push for policy change so that every place that uh, is going to be built in Egypt would be uh, built um, based on an accessible measures for persons with disabilities. And finally, we'll, we will create a platform that enables persons with disabilities to reach these locations and to have a normal life. Thank you very much for listening to Thank you so much, Amina. All very inspiring and inspiring stories indeed. Mohammed, let me turn to you. If you want to speak from the podium or from there, it's up to you. Share your views, what you've heard, but also maybe tell us a bit about what you do uh, in, in the department that might relate to what we're hearing here, either in the US, you know, what do social entrepreneurs in education do, or any cooperation you might have with Egypt or in the region. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Rise Egypt for putting together this wonderful event. And uh, I want to thank the Middle East Institute for, for being a partner. Uh, I'll make a few mentions of sort of ecosystems a little bit later uh, and just a few observations. But it's really important that, uh, that entrepreneurs find a healthy ecosystem to operate in. And that includes uh, partners uh, at NGOs, corporates, uh, universities, and colleges. Uh, K-12 has to build a pipeline, and, uh, and and government has to play a role in that as well. So we've got to think about this as an ecosystem. So I'm very appreciative of all the partners. I'm looking around the room, and I see folks from, from different sectors represented here. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Mona, for organizing. It was a very tough act to follow. You guys are doing some pretty amazing work. Paul asked me to share a few observations, and I'll start off by telling you a little bit about my portfolio at the Department of Education. Um, so I work with the International and Foreign Language uh, Education team. Uh, we fund uh, basically international education uh, programs that take the shape of world language learning uh, and world area studies, and a little bit of study abroad. Uh, those are in two portfolios, the Fulbright-Hayes portfolio, which some of you may have heard of, which are investing in small groups largely to go abroad, uh, and, and some, individual, some programs that are focusing on individuals, and then the Title VI programs which are really building capacity at um, our institutions here in the United States um, to train experts in different parts of the world to be able to speak uh, less commonly taught languages uh, with a high degree of, of fluency. So it's a, it's a really great portfolio to work with. It's a lot of fun. It's, a, uh, it's an area that for me is something that's very personal. I'm very passionate about it. My, my family immigrated from Egypt in 1976. And I often uh, actually told them this during my interview uh, for this role, that I, I've been an ambassador for international education since I was uh, probably about four years old. And I was a scrawny little kid on the playground and very quickly had to explain uh, to my peers uh, what was going on on the other side of the planet. Uh, back in the 80s, you may recall, you know, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of tension with the US and Iran. And uh, I had to very quickly explain what was going on. And then I also realized when during the summers when I would go visit family in Egypt, uh, I had to explain to my cousins and friends on the street that, no, I had not met Rambo. I did not know Mr. T. My dad did not drive a Ferrari, nor did I carry a gun. So I very quickly learned the value of, of, of a global perspective in education. So uh, I'll... I know the reason we're here today is to really talk about the, the entrepreneurs and the social entrepreneurs in the room and the amazing work that they're doing. So just a few observations, um, and I'll draw a few things from my work at the department. Um, you'll hear from Secretary Duncan uh, and uh, President Obama quite a bit about education being a civil right. Uh, we frame that in terms of access. So we at the department are thinking a lot about a combination of access and excellence. So. We have a very fundamental issue here in the United States, probably very similar to Egypt, in that there's just not enough kids getting to school. And when they're getting to school, we need to make sure we're delivering uh, a quality education so that they're able to be competitive um, in the global marketplace. And I certainly see some parallels there. I think one of the things that I've been taking forward with my work is, is to let folks know, given that my responsibility is, is global competency, that here in the United States, and I suspect in other parts of the world, here in the United States, we see one in five jobs are tied to international trade. So when we think about access, we see so many students at community colleges, 41% of our 
college students here in the United States are enrolled in community colleges. And many of these community colleges don't have a bench to deliver some of these global competencies at a level that we would like. Uh, they may not have a, a world language department, or they may offer one or two languages, but certainly not a, a full portfolio. They may not have a huge um, uh, portfolio of, uh, they may not have a, a, a big bench of faculty members to teach about different parts of the world. So partnerships within that ecosystem become important, but it's still something we fundamentally struggle with. I keep telling folks within the department that we have to think about access uh, and this discussion of, uh, of uh, education being a civil right beyond just, um, beyond just getting kids to school, beyond just the two-year or four-year experience of college. What's happening during those two or four years? Are they prepared for the next 50? Are they prepared for the next 50? And in my perspective, again, one in five American jobs are tied to international trade. So are, these, are our graduates bilingual? Are they competitive? Um, do they understand different parts of the world? Do they understand the ambiguity um, if we were to take an engineer off and engineer from one of our finest institutions here, from Michigan or Ohio State or Cal State, or, and we drop them off in a village outside of Cairo and we say, go build a bridge? Are they able to do that if they don't speak the language? Maybe they have the technical expertise, but their, their job becomes infinitely more difficult. And I think about, again, these graduates who don't have these skills, students from low income, uh, low income backgrounds, students in uh, challenging school districts, first generation students in this country, and they're excluded from the job market if they don't have these skills. So we're very much thinking about the access piece as well, and I think it's sort of a similarity that I, I know in Egypt the, the situation is much more dire. Um, my second observation, I, I will say, for, for some of the, the nonprofits here, um, which are doing some fantastic work, is that, you know, institutions have to be responsive to labor needs, right? We think about that a lot in terms of uh, pushing programs around project-based learning or um, STEM education or world languages and what's relevant. And again, remember, I'll go back to the world languages statistics that here we also assume in the United States that, one in, that, um, that everybody speaks English. Oh, everybody in the business community speaks English. And that's actually not actually tr that's not really true because 95% of the world's consumers are outside of US borders, and 75% of those folks don't speak English. So you do have to have these skills, and I think there's implications there for, for Egypt as well. Um, but institutions have to be responsive to, to their constituents. And that's one of the things I loved hearing about all three of these organizations, that they're very responsive and also very focused. Um, one of the, the, I think, the challenging things seeing in, in Egyptian higher education is that oftentimes students are just not prepared for, for, the, um, uh, for the global workforce. And I love seeing that these organizations are responsive, and hopefully that's something that you all can have an influence, and I'll get into this a little bit more, uh, in your involvement with, with other institutions and helping to create the ecosystem around you all so that you all will continue to be successful because you're not going to be able to just operate in a vacuum. And I would say sort of the third... Um, the third observation uh, is around evidence, and I think you, all, um, Adia, you brought this up a little bit in, in your comments. As your organizations continue to professionalize, um, more is going to be expected of you. You all are, all three of you are nonprofits, so you're seeking partnerships with, with corporates, with other institutions, perhaps with government agencies, but you're also probably spending some time on fundraising. Um, so you're going to have to be able to go out there and articulate what you're doing. You have to articulate the impact of it. You have to talk about evidence. We think a lot about evidence at the department because at the end of the day, yes, I, you know, I, I used to be a fundraiser in a previous life, but I'm still a fundraiser in my current job because we go to the Hill and we ask for money. And when we go to the Hill, we have to say, this is, this is the impact that our programs are having. And I think likewise, for you all as, as leaders in your organizations, you're going to have to do the same. Uh, and that goes for entrepreneur, for sort of traditional business entrepreneurs who will have to one day go out and ask an angel investor to invest in, um, in their companies. The evidence is critical, proof of concept. How are you, what's your impact? What does that look like? And what I would say is I think you know, one, of the, one of the important things that um, we need to continue to do, I say it from an education perspective, is that we need to tell our story a little bit better. We are in an age, sort of post-financial crisis, where resources are tight. Um, taxpayers and the general public demands transparency. They demand high impact. And that's critical, and it's important to talk about metrics, and it's important to show these metrics. But I'll also say let's not forget about the qualitative stories. Let's not, talk, let's, let's not forget about the lives that are impacted, because you guys all showed some pretty interesting and some really compelling 
stories here that are not just numbers. Those are not just statistics. You can show the big numbers, but make sure you balance the two out, I think, in your storytelling. Um, the, last, the last thing I, I will leave you with, I think, um, you know, when we talk about leadership, leadership isn't just a course we take in, in college. It isn't just sort of being in student government and showing up to a few, few fun meetings on campus uh, and having some debates about a particular issue to affect the student body. I, I think it's much, uh, leadership carries a very heavy burden. Um, but I would say for you all, you've, you've demonstrated that you're very engaged in your communities. My challenge for you is to, to connect with your partners and continue to build up that ecosystem around you. Um, play a role with the universities in your community. I know you have partnerships with AUC. I know um, uh, Cynthia's here from AUC. We're very excited to see you here. You guys are doing great work, and we're always appreciative of that. Um, but continue to develop that ecosystem and, and get involved in the way curriculums are being formed. We see that here in the US with a lot of universities. They bring in business leaders. Uh, they bring in folks from NGOs, folks from the State Department, folks from different parts of uh, of government to help shape what that student experience looks like. And it's not just there for the philanthropic implications. It's there to prepare graduates who are uh, able to be competitive. So I would say that's another thing to add on to your plate is continue to think about helping broader university leaders, help, think, help, help the K-12 leaders in your community think about different ways to prepare students. You have to think about a pipeline, right? You're, you're building a pipeline for the future, and you guys can be a part of that. You all are future employers. So don't forget about that. You're not just activists in the community. Um, social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are going to be the employers of the future. So you have a very important role to play in that. Um, I will leave my comments at that. I, I appreciate the disruption that you're bringing to the game, being someone who's in education. I love seeing it. I love that the three of you all are, are hyper-focused on addressing a particular issue that's Great to hear, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Paul, and take any Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for your comments, advice, insights. Uh, 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 time is a bit tight for our Q&A, and before turning it, turning it over to you, I want to uh, ask uh, one question to our three uh, entrepreneurs from Egypt. Uh, uh, none of you, unless I'm mistaken, mentioned the two bad words, money and government. Uh, and my question is, first on the money side, uh, uh, you know, where is it coming from? What's your model? And most importantly, how sustainable and growable is it on the money side? Clearly, the mission is, is, is laser focused. The impact socially is terribly valuable and clear. How do you sustain this financially? Uh, the second question is about government. Uh, we heard a lot uh, in the first session about the challenges of licensing and dealing with the government on sort of um, industrial or sort of trade issues. Uh, how, what's your relationship uh, at that level? A number of NGOs in Egypt have had troubles and problems. Uh, uh, so what's your story there? And if I may, you know, starting with you, Alia, and quickly so that we can get to the audience's questions and time is tight. Okay, perfect. Financial sustainability is super important, and that's what is all about social enterprise to have impact and have revenue. So we basically have revenue streams. We have dubbing and translation services. We're basically the main partner for Khan Academy in Egypt. So we translate and dub their content. And we have the content creation. So we have, we were working now with the MIT Technology Review to create their content and to turn their articles into videos. And the third one, which is I don't really call revenue stream, is the donations. So uh, having, having revenue streams is pretty good. Getting the money is pretty hard. So we have a lot of opportunities. We have a lot of projects that is running. Getting the money overseas is blocked. You cannot get money overseas. And when you ha we just won an MIT Best Social Enterprise in the Arab region uh, uh, last month. And getting the check uh, overseas is pretty, pretty hard. So we won the competition. We're not pretty sure that we can get the award. So we have the revenue streams. We have the plans. We have the deals. But getting the checks, I'm, I'm always telling my manager, we're putting them in the fridge. I'm not pretty sure that I can take the check. 
That's the first one. The second question is the, our relation with the government. It's a bit challenging, of course. It takes a lot of time to, to take permissions and papers and letters. So we decided to work with the community and to work with the crowd, uh, basically crowdsourcing. So our, our model is an online part, which is pretty easy because we have much freedom on, uh, online and you can put your license and you can create whatever you want without going through a governmental process. And you have the offline part, which we, which we work with Educate Me and people like Helm. They they take our manual, they work, and they go do the academic classroom in, in, in open space, in any brick and mortar space. So we don't really need to work with the government. Um, I think by 2020 we will need, because we have a dream of reaching 2 million Egyptian students and build Tahiya Academy schools. At this point, I think we'll be facing challenges. At this point of time, it's a bit challenging, but we don't need to work with the government at this point, point of time. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll start with a confession that I really, I've, I really dislike the word sustainability uh, because I think it's a, it's a very big buzzword that a lot of people talk about, uh, and nobody really understands what other people mean when they say sustainability. Uh, so I'll speak about the financial model, but before that, uh, I want to say that for us, we believe that uh, creating something or an impact that is sustainable is about creating a change that can recreate and regenerate itself. So it's not necessary for me to continue being there as an entity in order to do impact, but it's more necessary for me to create some kind of impact that keeps on changing based on the need uh, and develop people, develop local resources who can some, at some point in time figure out that there is a better model for them and then be capable of changing it as, as resources change and as the world changes. Uh, so Next to thinking about the financial model, we also think about the system, being systemic in our change. We think about the resources, we think about the documentation, we think about having proper uh, monitoring and evaluation system. Uh, in terms of our revenue model, 50% of our money comes from crowdfunding. Uh, and this was uh, mentioned at the beginning in one of the discussions, that uh, the local donations market in Egypt in 2009 was 590 million US dollars. And this is all, only... Uh, uh, charitable expenditure that was going around from Egyptians to Egyptians, where 86.7% of families participated in that. So there is money inside Egypt, uh, and giving is actually part of our DNA. So whether for philanthropic purposes or for religious purposes, regardless of which religion. Uh, so we use, we're, very, we're very good when it comes to crowdfunding. We have been doing it for five years, even before we understood what it's about. 20% of our money comes from, 30% uh, comes from grants and CSR. Uh, and we're very picky in terms of the people that we work with. Um, we're very keen on not letting go of our independence. So we choose partners uh, that kind of get with us into a partnership that so we can allow ourselves to be influenced, also allow them to be influenced and not really give away um, anything when it comes to impacts. We're very, we can very easily uh, tell a donor, you know what? No, we don't want to continue. We don't think we're aligned when it comes to our value system. So we get access to the resources without really compromising our impact. And the last 20% comes from uh, revenue generation, and we plan on increasing this over time. Um, so we provide training services uh, for a charge to teachers, to parents, and to other educational NGOs. Um, we also started the charging a tuition fee, a symbolic tuition fee to our kids. And this was very progressive in terms of thinking of the economics of education and whether or not actually the whole concept of education being free uh, is or isn't or can be working. So in Egypt, it's said that education is free, but eventually there are, I, I think, 1.5 billion uh, pounds that go into private tutoring. So eventually, even the poor people have to pay for education. So for maybe formalizing the process of uh, education and formalizing the way money is put in in order to guarantee quality could be uh, something to think about. So we started charging a tuition fee, a very symbolic, and we found that even the base of the pyramid are willing to pay because they really understand um, the, the value of it. Uh, in terms of government, uh, like Alia said, we're under the Ministry of Social Solidarity. It took us 14 months to legalize at the beginning. Uh, we had a lot of uh, international award and grant money that was blocked, but it eventually got approved uh, a few months ago. Of course, it's very difficult to manage your cash flow because you don't know when the money is going to come in. So we, we apply for it, we win it, but then we keep crowdfunding uh, just in case. Um, so we have been only dealing with the government in terms of the Ministry of Social Solidarity for uh, administrative and financial accountability. Ministry of Education, we've been uh, avoiding them, to be honest, so far, uh, because it's very, it could be very tricky. 
um, especially that we're trying to challenge uh, who should define what people should know uh, and how people should know, and we, we're not necessarily um, we're not necessarily sure that this is uh, going to be of uh, general interest. Uh, but however, now that we have been approached by certain governments, we're starting to see that government is not just a big black box, like uh, it was uh, highlighted in the first panel that there may be certain levers inside the government who are willing to change, and we're willing to actually take the risk with these people. We're willing to identify them, or we're willing to uh, be open to being approached by them, maybe trying pilots here and there, uh, trying as much as possible to steer away from the very big uh, bureaucratic um, governmental bodies like the Ministry of Education with, I don't know, 1.5 million employees, and to maybe try and do certain pilots with other more progressive, uh, dynamic, maybe even new governments, and maybe use this to influence uh, the bigger, um, like the bigger institutions like the Ministry of Education. Uh, okay, I have to agree with uh, Yasmin and uh, Alia with several things. Um, when Jazur were saying it took them four months to be a registered uh, company, it took us about two years to be a registered NGO during the political uh, situation situation in Egypt. Um, and of course, um, <coughs> most people would ask where, how, and how is it possible that you exist um, in such a situation? Um, of course, we, um, Rams and I were AUC graduates, so we were able to uh, create a club, a community service club in AUC, and that basically helped us overcome these two years because we were able to function as a student club. Uh, in terms of finances, uh, we used to uh, still deal with corporates as Helm NGO, and we used to explain to corporates our situation. Um, the AUC has been very, very um, collaborative it's still, um, you know, we were depending on students to do the work as well as volunteers. Um, and it has been quite difficult because we had a full-time job and at the same time we had um, Hilm to take care of. So um, it was almost uh, unbearable by the end of the two years um, and that's why we quit our jobs in December. Uh, to focus uh, solely on Helm. Um, the other uh, problem is that um, the disability field is very tricky. So when gathering money and asking for donations, um, we tried to, try to avoid that for a while, uh, to take from individuals money, um, except from our networks, because we didn't want people to think that they, sh they should, uh, you know, give in money because it's people with disabilities who need help. Uh, we actually provide our services to corporates and companies, and this is how Helm survives. We uh, ask them, they have a need, they need to hire and fulfill the 5% quota of persons with disabilities, so they need their, the people to be trained. So basically, we provide training services, we provide the community days for a good fee, we're a lot cheaper than events companies, so we are um, a very attractive, uh, you know, we, we provide very attractive offers, so all the companies come back. And so far, the past year and a half, we have had um, many of the multinationals do several events with us and we have uh, been able to sustain that very well. Um, as for the government, dealing with the government, um, actually on this trip uh, we got to, um, I got to meet Abir Shakir, which uh, she's the uh, minister's uh, consultant for the Ministry of Education, uh, for the Ministry of um, Information Technology, uh, for Communication and Information Technology. And uh, she was, um, you know, I told her honestly that we were very skeptical about working with them they have approached us several times and we were very worried about how and and you know if if we would work with the company on such a big project like um, in Talaq it's such an, a huge project but actually we've been working so hard and our team has been working very hard whether on a volunteer basis or full-timers to actually achieve results so we weren't willing to just um, you know destroy all of that and somebody and, and making it you know go to the wrong hands um, if I may say um, so she actually she reassured me of all the troubles that are happening in the government. She reassured me how difficult her job is. She's um, she's actually new in the ministry. So she explained that she will do whatever it takes to protect our project when we're partnering. And actually, this trip has been very useful, um, thanks to Rise and Mona, that we actually, you know, you never you never know what's going to happen and who you're going to meet. Um, but actually, this, you know, she's there in Egypt and we got to meet here. But the outcome of such a, you know, two days of sitting together for six hours a day discussing all the details about Helm and the ministry's work and how we can collaborate to do a project that is effective. And of course, I won't lie, if the government agrees to work with us and 
this is what we need. The government needs to take care of these huge projects that we're doing, whether it's about education, like uh, what Tahrir and, and uh, Educate Me are doing. Uh, basically, what we're doing on the ground, we, I'm sure, I'm sure you would agree that what we want to see is that everyone in Egypt gets good quality education and good quality training, and 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 this is why we exist. But but at the same time. If it's done, it needs to be done in the right way. And this is, I think, why we're holding our grounds. Um, and um, we could also, you know, I think we just wish for the best and wish that, you know, these collaborations can actually turn into something good. So thank you. Thank you, Amina. We're running late. Obviously, we'll take one round of questions uh, and then back to the panel before we break uh, for lunch. So any comments or questions, raise your hand. The microphone will come to you. Introduce yourself as well and be brief, thank you. Hi, my name is Amin Rajan and I'm a student at Georgetown University studying conflict resolution. And uh, thank you very much for being here, wonderful projects. Um, a few months back, I think Middle East Institute had hosted another panel uh, talking about the online education in Egypt. And uh, um, there was a representation from Nafham, Mr. El Alpi was here. And it seemed like their <clears throat> model of online education was very similar not exactly the same, but similar to Tahrir Academy. And I was wondering if there's any conversation of partnership with similar organizations sort of competing with each other because they're doing the same exact thing. Um, and uh, Ms. Lal spoke of the issue with curriculum pedagogy and how is the online education is, is trying to address that. And second very quick one was another issue that was discussed in that panel was the issue with um, the compensation for the teachers. They're not properly compensated, which is causing the tuition industry to come up, which has become a $1.2 billion million pounds industry. Um, and, and your model is charging teachers to get, get them the training. And I'm wondering, how is that working out? Can teachers even afford to do that? Thank you. Any uh, other questions? Well, if, yes, there's, uh, yeah. Wait, uh, microphone, thank you. Actually, if they want to answer the question, I'm happy to make just a comment at the end. You will make a comment at the end. Uh, any other questions, or has hunger gotten the best <laughs> of our audience? I have, I have uh, one question uh, to Alia. You talked about uh, scaling and you know maybe taking it to the region. Uh, the Middle East Institute also holds a lot of events on refugees, uh, uh, and there's now millions of refugees and displaced people in Syria and Libya and Yemen in particular, and in Iraq as well. Uh, and I know that there are groups that are trying through online mechanisms to provide these, the children of refugees with this, uh, with this outlet for education. Have you had experience, partnerships, or anything of that nature? So let's go through, a, I think there were questions to you and to Yasmin. Okay, answering your, your question regarding partnerships, we're actually working already with NAFAM because NAFAM are mainly focusing on digitalizing the content and putting it online through uh, crowd the teaching. And they're actually taking Tahiya Academy's videos and they're putting it on their website. Uh, our main focus is blended learning, which is a bit different because we decided to focus on the methodology. So we're not only online education, we have the offline component too. That's basically us. So we're actually working together. And the more online platforms, the more we will be happier because we're going to provide more quality education. The second question, yes, basically we've been approached, but on individual base from Syrian to how to use our manual and toolkit to provide TA classroom. So basically the best way to do it is to do partnerships with the community centers, with NGOs and with other enterprises. So we have the teachers coming to our enterprise and then we give them training on how to use the manual and then they go back home or they go back in their areas and to deliver the TA classrooms. And what we're doing is we're connecting volunteers from different areas with the uh, organization NGOs. So they have the know-how and they go to the students with the 13 to 18 age bracket and they deliver to a classroom. So scalable, So actually scaling here is pretty simple because well, uh, I think six months back, our model was only focusing on Egypt. Tweaking a small, small thing in the model, which is the toolkit, having the manual, was the point where we started scaling in Saudi Arabia, in um, Tunisia, in uh, Algeria. We had a lot of people working and delivering Tahiya Academy classroom. So this is the way to scale through the TA manual. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you for your question. Um, first, regarding the... Um, uh, regarding the fees, so uh, our target for selling the trainings is not uh, public school teachers, actually. It's uh, private school teachers. Uh, it's a different kind of a, a different class. So it's uh, 
private school teachers who again could be teaching in, in schools and getting a lot of money, but they're not necessarily, don't necessarily have the right tools and don't, don't necessarily teach with the right pedagogy. Uh, same for parents, even in class A, maybe societies. Uh, again, how to raise your child, uh, how to uh, nurture curiosity, how to do certain things, again, is something that needs to be taught. Uh, so the people who we charge for our trainings are different from uh, the public school teachers. It's a completely different market. Uh, your second question regarding online learning. Um, again, for us, we're, we're mostly about creating frameworks, skill-based frameworks. So basically, a child for a child, like critical thinking skills are one, two, three, four, five, and a child who's six years old needs to know one, be able to do one, two, three, four, five. So for us, um, online learning is just a tool. Uh, so this makes it very easy to collaborate with other people. Once we know what kind of skills we need to develop, if we find someone who has the tools, again, like Tahir Academy, and we've already done that, then they just come and they do the delivery or we use the tool that they have. Uh, and same also for the content, because again, what you need to know um, is very, should be very different depending on where you are uh, and what kind of context you're in. So for us, information uh, is not, again, that important. Again, it's about the skill that you need um, and the context that you're in. So people who develop, who create uh, curricula or create information, again, become people that we partner with to fill in a certain, or to develop a certain skill or a certain standard. So tools, content creators are, are people who can fit into the framework that we develop. Thank you, Yasmin. Amina and Hamad, do you have any closing comments? I was going to say one, one quick comment. Uh, you know, Paul, you brought up the issue of the refugees and um, uh, you know, what a disaster, what a disaster across the region. But I think um, with these di types of disruptions, um, delivery of a curriculum virtually, um, you know, a lot of there's, there's some discussion, I think, within the development community is as we think about refugees across the world, that education has to be part of the response because, you know, sort of now we're seeing refugees are, are, are uh, in this state for months, if not years, and the learning process is disrupted and, and the workforce is disrupted. And, and uh, these folks who are in this unfortunate situation um, are, are not going to be uh, are not going to be competitive. So. You know, I think uh, these types of models are, are are very effective for some of these very challenging situations. Yeah, thank you, Mohammed. Before uh, closing and thanking our panel, Mona, uh, would you like to say something? So there, there were a few comments uh, I wanted to bring up. First of all, I'm struck as I'm standing that we have three women entrepreneurs. I'm not usually someone who points out the gender thing, but I. Um, but uh, in the United States, 10% of uh, entrepreneurs are women, and in the Middle East, it's 25%. So that breaks some stereotypes. Um, and then I also was struck by the fact, as I was thinking about each one of these teams and how they were saying how many full-timers they have and whatever, the earlier statistic I gave, um, which I think was done by the government of Egypt and AmCham, was that 98% of uh, businesses in Egypt have less than 10 employees. Uh, already all of these teams have more than 10. So they're in the 2%. So how do we support them, given the complexities of the challenges that we have discussed today? Um, and so I wanted to sort of uh, take a f just one minute, I promise, because I know I stand, I haven't had a thing to eat all day either, so I'm just, you know, I understand. Um, but to explain a little bit about what we're doing here other than this event, which we uh, are so excited that uh, we were able to share together. Um, all the entrepreneurs are here for about two weeks, uh, give or take, uh, depending on the team. And what we've done as an organization is that we've worked with them to identify two growth stage challenges to their organizations and businesses, and then build out a program of capacity building um, that will happen through the accelerator, which is why they're here in the United States, um, that we're sponsoring through the RISE Fellowship. Uh, and, and in doing that, what we're doing is we're leveraging the global network that we've built uh, and that we continue to build and that we hope that you will join um, in order to help set up the trainings, the relationships, the learning partnerships, the hopefully business development opportunities, um, exposures uh, uh, that they are getting in these two weeks. Um, and so to give a few, just a few examples of that, um, Amina was at a conference earlier, the M Enabling Conference, and that's where she ended up hooking up with the government official where they can actually end up partnering because they've had this time outside, but and also in meeting other people. Megdi just came back from 
one of the largest um, conferences on waste and recycling in Las Vegas um, called Waste Expo, where he spent about three days. But beyond that, um, we're also you know, we're also doing spe very specific trainings around design thinking, branding, organizational development and leadership, um, corporate and nonprofit governance, um, accountability, and all these sorts of things. Um, and we're and we're doing the research training, because like I said earlier, we're think and do tank. So there's the capacity building part and there's also the research part. Um, so the teams in which we're working on piloting specific things, like the blended learning model, we're working on how do we design a proper pilot um, for something like that, the early childhood education. Those, those teams are gonna be coming up to Boston where we've organized trainings at, um, at Harvard and at MIT um, in partnership with J-PAL. Allison's supposed to be here somewhere. There you are, hi Allison. Um, you know, around, uh, study design um, and uh, randomized control trials and how you link to policy and how that translates so that we can address these issues um, that we're talking about. I was at a conference a few months ago and I met a woman who was running a model almost exactly like what Yasmin has done, but in Colombia, Colombia the country. She thought I was talking about uh, District of Columbia. And when I told her this news, and we're actually gonna hop on a plane and go to Bogota, Colombia and meet with them. Why? Because they're about 10 years ahead of us um, in the work that they're doing in Colombia, where they've scaled from their first schools, which is the position that Yasmin is in, to now serving 13,000 children and about to scale up to 100,000. And they partnered with Rutgers University in this process, whereby they did a longitudinal study to measure the impact and outcomes of this, not just in education outcomes, but also on health, on community engagement, and other sort of indicators. So this is exactly the type of strategic approach that we, we would like to take in partnership with the teams, um, and, and that's why we're going to study it. From their perspective, to learn about, you know, to see it with their own eyes and ask the questions that they need. And from our perspective, the reason why we're going is because I wanna learn also about this process. How do they connect to national development strategy? How do they connect to policy? They're now working directly on regional policy with Latin America as well with the SDGs. Um, and so these things are, these are, the, these are the things that I think we can bring to the table that are unique. Um, and, and, and we're gonna synergize with other organizations and after the lunch, we're gonna get to hear um, from Chris and Rana, which I'm so excited about, and Rana will get to share a little bit uh, more in that vein as well. But I guess I'll turn it back over to you and say, um, you know, please also join our global network, which you can do easily online and be a part of this with the teams. Thank you, Mana. Thank you. Before releasing you to grab some lunch and come back into the room for our lunch session, I'm sure you agree this was an extremely valuable and inspiring session. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists.